Hello, and thank you for your interest in STARS. My name is Jordan King, STARS Program Coordinator at AISHI, and in this video, I'll be walking you through the STARS data collection process. Before we dive in, I want to mention that the way you go about collecting STARS data on your campus will vary depending on how many people you have on your team, which credits you pursue, what process works best for you, and many other factors. So in this video, I want to focus on sharing the resources that are available to you and some examples of what has worked for others. One thing that most institutions find helpful is to have buy-in from their administration. This can come in many forms, but being able to point to some demonstration of top-level support can come in handy when you're sending emails out to folks across campus and asking them to provide you with data. For some institutions, you may be able to have your administration send out an email voicing their support. You may have some type of long-term sustainability goal that you can point to or even a specific KPI that relates to sustainability benchmarking or performance. Regardless, having some demonstration of support for the STARS process will be helpful before getting started on data collection. When it comes to actually entering data into the reporting tool, you have a couple of options. The first is to have a single person in charge of entering data. With this option, data will be provided directly to that one person who enters it, and they may be the only one with access to the STARS reporting tool. Some institutions find that this provides an element of quality control and ensures that someone has a full picture of what's being submitted, but this can also mean additional workload on that one individual. The other option is to use a more distributed model by providing access to numerous individuals who are each responsible for entering data for their specific STARS credits or fields. This can be a more efficient option if you have a team of people that you trust to help manage that data. The approach you choose depends on which option you think will work best for you and for your institution. Regardless of how you decide to enter data, I would highly recommend that you back up your data in a central location. We do an automatic backup of our database every day, but it's always a good idea to save a copy of your data before entering it into the tool. Here's a quick overview of how to add users to the tool. From the My Summary page, you'll navigate to the Users tab. Here you will see a list of all of the users that already have access to your reporting tool, their email, their role, and the last time that they logged in. The role allows you to control each person's level of access in the reporting tool, and there are three options, Administrator, Data Entry, and Observer. Administrators have complete access to all features of the reporting tool. They can add, change, and delete other users, they can manage and share data, and they can submit reports. Data entry users can enter and save data within credits, and observers have view-only access to the information saved in completed credits. One thing to keep in mind is that if you give someone data entry access, they will have access to all of the credits, not just the ones that they need to edit. Adding users is easy. Simply click Add a User, enter the person's email, select their role from the dropdown, and then click Save. So knowing this, let's talk about who might be on your team. There are several stakeholders you might want to consider. The first is a sustainability champion. This is someone who is energetic and enthusiastic about sustainability, and often this is the person who will lead the STARS process. If you have a sustainability office or committee on your campus, then you already have access to a group of campus stakeholders who are interested in and knowledgeable about sustainability. These individuals can take responsibility for coordinating data collection for specific subcategories or credits. Even if they aren't actively engaged in gathering data, they may be helpful in determining who to ask for data, or they may know of an initiative or a program that could be recognized in a particular credit that you weren't aware of. Having a wide variety of people engaged in some way will make the process easier. Students can also participate in STARS data collection, Perhaps an enthusiastic faculty member can create a course focused solely on STARS, or maybe STARS can be integrated into an existing course. STARS can also serve as a great thesis project for a graduate student or the focus of a student internship. And finally, you'll want to consider all of your potential data providers on campus. These are the individuals distributed across campus in various offices and departments who will be able to share with you the data that you need for your STARS report. Now let's dive into the details of the data collection process. The first step is to figure out which credits you'll be pursuing, and a great place to start is with applicability. This is where some of the many resources we've created will come in handy. 
you can take a look at the STARS credit checklist as well as the technical manual and mark any credits that are not applicable to your institution. You may even want to make a copy or download a copy of this spreadsheet and gray out any of the credits that you plan to mark as not applicable in your submission. For details on when a credit can be marked as not applicable, you'll need to consult the technical manual or the credit checklist for each credit. Next, you'll want to think beyond applicability. Even if a credit is applicable to your institution, that doesn't mean that you must pursue it. You'll want to ask yourself questions like, which credits could be easily earned? Which are the most relevant to our institution? And which are unlikely to be earned for this submission? This is going to require you to get fairly familiar with each credit, which means becoming comfortable with the criteria outlined in the technical manual. One example of this that I experienced when I was working in higher ed was with the investment subcategory. Early on in the data collection process, it became clear that the investment credits would likely be very difficult for us to pursue. While we didn't give up and it became the start of a conversation about what we could do in the future, it was helpful to know that several of these credits would likely be marked as not pursuing in the current submission so that we could focus our time and energy on other credits. Another reason for doing this step first is that while most credits can be completed with readily available data, some credits require the completion of an assessment or inventory. For example, the academic courses credit requires an inventory of the institution's sustainability course offerings. The process of completing these assessments can have enormous value in terms of setting baselines and identifying opportunities for improvement, but it can also take a significant amount of time and planning. It's therefore helpful to plan an approach to these credits early on in the data collection process. Step two is to map out your data contacts. STARS requests data that will need to be sourced from a variety of departments across campus. This process helps build relationships and also encourages staff and faculty members to better understand the role their office or department can play in building institutional sustainability. Locating the departments and individuals that have the information that you need can involve some detective work. So allow time to map where sustainability data lives on your campus. As we saw, the first tab of the STARS credit checklist contains information for you to mark credits as not applicable or not pursuing. On the next tab, you'll find a spreadsheet for tracking the data contacts for each credit. As you're going through the technical manual to understand what type of data will be required, you will also want to think about who has that data, keeping in mind that for some credits, you may need to request data from several individuals. You can start adding contact names and information to this spreadsheet so that you're ready for some of the next steps in the process. Before you start actually reaching out to your data contacts, you'll want to understand the reporting timeframes within STARS so that you can tell these contacts the exact year or years for which you need data. Each credit in STARS has a specific time frame from which the reported information must be drawn. The majority of STARS credits use the following two time frames. The first is to report current information as of the date of submission, and the second is to report the most recent information available from within three years prior to the submission date. You will need to reference the credit checklist or technical manual to determine the specific time frame for each credit because there are some exceptions to these two. Also, while some STARS credits are qualitative, making it fairly easy to identify the most up-to-date information, for example, policies, programs, and initiatives that are or will be active on the anticipated date of submission. Other credits, such as the water use credit, require that you specify a performance year. The years that you choose will depend on when you plan to submit your report and the data that is available for each credit. You are welcome to report data from calendar years, academic years, and or fiscal years, and you're not required to use the same baseline and performance years across all STARS credits. For instance, it's perfectly acceptable to use the most recent fiscal year for some credits, a recent calendar year for others, and to report on a current program that launched two years ago for another credit. While you're familiarizing yourself with STARS and figuring out exactly what data you need and from whom, you may want to go ahead and send out some introductory emails to folks you know you'll be asking for data. This can soften your future data request a little bit by giving them a heads up about what STARS is and the timeline you have in mind for gathering data and submitting the report. You can find some example templates on the STARS website under the Forms and Templates section. One tip to keep in mind when you send out your introduction emails is that it can be helpful to mention the timeline you have in mind for reporting and the potential deadline for data. Setting a faux deadline can ensure that you stick with your submission timeframe. For example, if your actual submission deadline is December 1st, 
you may want to let your contacts know that you need all of the data by October 1st. This will give you time to follow up with anyone who's not provided the data by that deadline, and it will also allow for an internal or external review process. This is, of course, just an example. The exact amount of wiggle room you need before your submission date could be more or it could be less. The fifth step of the process is to choose your data collection templates. One great resource we released with version 2.2 are our editable Google Docs for each credit. These can be downloaded or copied and customized for your data collection needs. When I was working on a STARS report at an institution many years ago, I had to create these from scratch by copying and pasting everything in the technical manual into Word documents. These customizable Google Docs will make things a lot easier for you and save you a lot of time. All you'll need to do is download these documents to your Google Drive or as Word documents, and then you can customize them for each individual that you need to send them to, or you can provide access to multiple people and color code or flag certain fields or sections for them to complete. I found it very helpful to customize them a bit. For instance, if I was needing three data fields completed by someone, I wouldn't want them to be overwhelmed or distracted by the fact that the credit might have 10 to 20 required data fields. I would remove all of the information that wasn't pertinent to them so that they could focus on providing only the relevant data. However, other data providers may need to fill out an entire credit or they may need to have all of the supporting information available to them. You'll learn what works best for the individuals at your institution and for you, there isn't necessarily a right or a wrong way to do it. You can also download a blank master spreadsheet that includes all of the STARS reporting fields if you prefer to work in Google Sheets or Excel. If you already have data that's been entered into the reporting tool or that has been migrated over from a past report, you can also download a spreadsheet with this data already included. This can be helpful if you want to share what was submitted in the last report with your data providers when asking them for updated information for a new submission. Now that we've covered some of the most common data collection best practices and examples, you will need to determine what process works best for you. You'll want to obtain executive level support, determine who's on your team and what data entry model you'll use. You'll need to get familiar with the STARS technical manual and decide which credits to pursue. You want to map out those data contacts and start thinking about your reporting timeframes. And then you'll need to maintain frequent communication with your data providers. For instance, here are some examples of emails you might want to send. An introductory email and initial data request, several back and forth emails to clarify criteria and answer questions, and possibly to set up meetings, a check-in on progress and an upcoming deadline reminder, followed by an additional check-in if data is still needed after the deadline has passed, and finally, you may want to follow up to let your contacts know that the report's been submitted, and again, when the rating is awarded. If this is your first STARS report, keep in mind that you are creating a process from scratch, and reporting will become easier. This first report will serve as a foundation and allow you to simply update information for a subset of credits in the future. This is particularly true for institutions that decide to report more often than every three years. I hope this video has been helpful. Thank you again for your interest and participation in STARS. Please reach out with any questions that you have at stars at hg.org.